Hello, it's Ren Presents Time. I'm your host, Ren. And today we continue with the House of Bloodstein, Perlamum, Chapter 10, Wham! And I have a few surprises and a warning today. So, instead of just reading Chapter 10, Wham!, we will proceed straight away to Chapter 11, which is Thomasina the 19th. Because the Wham! chapter is pretty short. Kill two birds with one stone, Chapter 10, Wham! And Chapter 11, Thomasina the 19th. And if you've read other League of Elder books, you should know exactly who Thomasina the 19th is. But if not, we will get to her. Now, I have a warning, a content warning. We're getting into the part of the book that has rather explicit and adult descriptions left and right. It's not a big deal, but still, will Hella Corman Grand, the mad black hat of Wham, really earns her stripes? She is a, a very burlesque very body sort of person and she has quite a sense of humor for a black hat which is black hats normally don't have much of a sense of humor but she does and she's into body humor yeah that's what's going to be happening in these chapters lots of body humor lots of naked people lots of vague descriptions of these naked people it's nothing earth shattering but still my books are not for kids they're for adults if you're a kid drop out now okay i mean yeah yeah youtube yeah i'm sorry but that's the way it has to be my books are usually pretty clean but they do sometimes get into extremes such as we're gonna have here in the next chapter or so a couple years ago i was at a convention a comic-con in chicago a gentleman with a salt and pepper beard came up to my table. We talked and he said, uh, which one of your books is good for, for kids? You know, for third graders, I think he said. And I thought about it. And, you know, my books have a lot of science fiction violence and romance and so forth. But they're generally, as far as language goes, except for book nine, which has a lot of cussing, are, are pretty tame. And I had just published this book, The House of Bloodstein. I'm proud of it. And for the most part, it's a, I think it's a, it's a, it's a student friendly book. And I, I recommend it. Yeah. The House of Bloodstein. And I signed it for him. I forget his name and, and his class. And I handed it to him and he, he walked away into the throng of people. And then I immediately realized I forgot about this specific part of the book, which is pretty adult you know and that's not who I am that's not what I'm about that's not how I roll I'm not trying to pander or push anything I left my table I ventured out into the crowds trying to find the the gentleman so I could explain that you know I, I made a mistake I forgot about these couple chapters here and I wanted to give him a, a, a different book but gosh you know there were so many people I couldn't find him to save my life and, you know, I've been thinking about the gentleman and his class ever since. And, sir, if, you, if you're out there, if you're watching this video, if you're listening, I apologize. I mean, I'm sure it's not that really that big of a deal. But, you know, kids are a lot more sophisticated than I was, you know, back in the 70s. God knows. But I didn't mean it. It was an honest mistake. And if you would like my offer to replace the book with another, any of my other books for free, I'll even throw in shipping is good to this day i want to make it right if it needs to be made right because that's just try to have some some integrity try don't always succeed but there it is so let's dig in shall we let's get into these chapters first chapter chapter 10 wham they made the trip back to xandar prime the goshawk moving low and fast Kay kept a watch for the Wonderlux, but didn't see them. Undetected, they returned to Xandar Prime and walked number six back through the throng of people to her villa. Sarah and Philip gave Kay and number six some privacy. She was sad and reflective. So, Kay, I bid you goodbye. Enjoy your life with your Monoma. While it lasts, 
I shall remain here with my sisters. I shall indulge myself, revel in distractions, and live as I will. And when the last brick is set into place on your monomous tomb, I shall return to Blanchford and hold you to your promise. As you wish, Kay took her hand and kissed it. Then she entered the villa. He returned to the goshawk. Sarah and Philip were busy inside, fully restocking Sam's trunks with the items they purchased. Number six gone? Sarah asked. She is. I can't believe she handed over the piece so easily. What did she want? She must have wanted something. She did, and I suppose she'll be coming to collect in 90 years or so. They filled a small bag with eye drops and balms for Sam. Kay sighted the sky, still no signs of the Wonderlux. Leaving the goshawk cloaked, Kay led them to the inn. While Sarah and Philip settled into their rooms, Kay came in and found Sam still fast asleep, her face moonlike in King's light. Thank you for watching, Sam, Kay said. King ruffled his feathers in response. The rest had done wonders for her. Her skin tone was nearly back to normal, and she seemed invigorated. He woke her and sat her up, checking her over. How do you feel, Sam? Better. Much better, love. I, I dreamed of you. We got your things, and we discovered a piece of Lady Chrysania's Perlamum set. Here, let me help you. He gave Sam her eye drops and rubbed her dry skin with the rosemary balm King had suggested. Soon, they went out into the marketplace, and Kay bought her several changes of colorful clothes, revealing, as always, for Xandar. Are you feeling better, Sam? She hung on his arm. I feel so much better. Space is just so debilitating for me. But here on the ground with you, and with number six far away, I'm feeling my old self again. Though I can't blink or change shape, I'm stuck like this. I like you just as you are. They linked up with Sarah and Philip and ate out on the terrace. Sam liked the cuisine on Xandar and had a healthy appetite after her ordeal, tearing bread and dipping it into rich sauces. So, we're going to tarry here for the night and then take you home when your strength is back up, Kay said. Sam ate her food with relish. She shook her head. I don't want to go home, Kay. We have this revised retinue of vitamins provided by King, which should help. And plenty of balm and eye drops. I should be fine. No, I'm not going to take the chance. Please, Kay, can we at least try? I'm certain I'll be fine. My name is on that list, too. Well, Hella is expecting me as well. You'll not walk into a black hat's lair without me at your side. In the morning, Sam awoke. She washed and took her medications. They checked out of the inn and were soon winging their way from Xandar into the dark night of Zaffin space. I'm sorry for my sh poor showing on the planet. Not very ladylike of me, was it? Sam said. It's okay, Sam, Sarah said, excited. So here it is. She pulled the box out and opened it. Inside was an intricate turquoise perlamum piece. Left bishop taken from God's temple in the Valley of the Moons. She flipped it over and looked at the bottom. It's even got Lady Chrysania's coat of arms stamped on the base. You should have seen that place, Sam. We followed the tour out into the desert, past the mountains, and there was this creepy, cool old temple out in the middle of nowhere. It was sort of like 1000 Carrot Hill Park, except there were stone statues everywhere inside. It was this statue of a lady wearing a pair of goggles holding the box, and we took it from her. Sarah got her pocket terminal out of her duster, snapped a quick photo of the piece, and sent it on to Lady Chrysania. One down. We'll be taking you home tomorrow, Sam. Philip said. Do you feel you're up to the trip? I'm not going home, Philip. I'm coming to Wham with you. I'll be fine. Philip turned to Kay. She wants to give it a try. I think she'll be fine. Sarah had transcribed the new schedule of vitamins and meds for Sam to take from King. With her back turned, he carefully spoke the list out with Sarah typing it into her pocket terminal. Why would you speak when people are looking at you? She asked King. That question is irrelevant. Sarah gave the list to Sam, who, huddled under a blanket, rearranged the content of her trunk to accommodate the changes King had suggested. She followed the new schedule religiously and stayed relatively comfortable as the trip wore on. She and Kay went to thank King for the advice. 
Sam, with her back turned, offered her full thanks for his help. You're welcome, came King's voice in reply. In the empty veil of Zaffin territory, the hollow terminal was normally dead, sputtering at random with no signal, which was quite a departure from the League, which had the airnet covering almost all of its territory. In Zaffin space, the waves were mostly empty until in the vicinity of an inhabited system. However, with great frequency, the hollow terminal suddenly came to life and there would be a fresh message from Wilhella, normally of a chiding and taunting note. Other times, the hollows were lewd and grotesque. Apparently, she broadcast a weekly program in Wham, and the four of them had become a favorite subject of broadcasting material for her. She plied her vast macabre imagination in their direction. She broadcast shows featuring perfect shadow tech images of the four of them in various pornographic positions, engaging in bloody, lust-filled orgies. She broadcast them fighting in any number of creative and exciting setups, either fighting amongst themselves or with a variety of beasts to the death, like gladiators. Nobody really wanted to view any of this except for Sarah, who was morosely transfixed by it, watching every second. One broadcast featured a nude Kay and a nude Sam fighting a hundred nude Sarahs in a bloody arena. Sarah was not at all happy with how easily her shadow tech facsimiles were killed. Look, if there really were a hundred of me fighting the two of you, you guys wouldn't stand much of a chance. Seriously, she yelled, pointing at the cone and greatly put off. Of greater concern was Wilhella's tendency to call out their exact position in space with alarming accuracy. They were cloaked and in the middle of nowhere, yet Wilhella broadcast frequent updates as to their exact position. After such incidents, Philip would have to plunge into the pilot's chair and violently change course, as Zaffin warlords in space, eager to make a name for themselves and collect a hefty ransom for their capture, quickly descended upon their position. A variety of ships came to get them old lumbering mercy ships, a number of Gome vessels, including the large Gome 52 battleship, an old Princess Marleth favorite, and some of those bizarre Bundarunga ships from Wham. Once a giant statue of a swimming female came in on their position. The statue and a squadron of mercy clunkers even fought a small battle over the right to be there. How in the name of creation is Wilhella zeroing us time and time again? Sarah asked, staring out the glass. I don't know, Kay said, but she's not truly intent on our capture. If she was, she'd continually funnel information to the various warlords and prevent our escape. I think she enjoys seeing us and the various Zaffin players scramble while she watches the chaotic aftermath. The question is, how are we going to stop her, Philip asked. I, for one, do not want a black hat knowing our every move. As we approach Wham, it's not safe, and it could not danger Rose. So how's she doing it? Sarah said. The answer to the question should be obvious, came King's voice from behind. Sarah looked back. Really? Okay, then let's hear it. Silence. Look away, Sarah, will you? Kay said abruptly. Sarah couldn't get the no-look thing through her head with King. She huffed and turned. We are infiltrated with STTs. It is these STTs that are giving the Mad Black Hat continual updates as to our location. I detected hundreds of them on your persons while on Xandar, which I burned away with my sight, though they keep auto-replicating at a slow but steady rate. She must have snared us with Whammock during our communication with her the other day, Philip said. Snared with STT, she can zero us at her leisure. That manky black hat, Sarah said. Got to give it to her. She's a sneaky little goose. King continued. Also, the peace we retrieved is covered with them as well. I have cleared them out as best I can. So what are we going to do about it, Sam asked, highly concerned. I suggest we proceed to Wham as quickly as we can. I also recommend we cleanse in my sight every few hours to rid ourselves of respawn STTs. Perhaps with frequent cleansings we shall be rid of them for good and may proceed in peace. And with that, we conclude chapter 10. Wham, as I promised, pretty short chapter. So Wilhella Corman Grand 
loves playing games and she's completely fixated on these people at the moment as they make their way across Saffin space trying to get to her temple in Wham. STTs, if you recall from other readings, are very small shadow tech constructs. They're usually, if you were to look at them up close, they kind of look like a cockroach, sort of. You know, just a black cockroach. If you can see them, because they're oftentimes cloaked into invisibility, they can do virtually anything the the creator of them wishes. They can, you know, lie in wait. They can haunt certain areas. They can explode. They can catch fire. They can create earthquakes. They can summon lightning. They can hop on your hop on you and cause you personal distress and bad fortune they can do a lot pretty tough to deal with because they're so small fortunately king's silver sight destroys them cleanses them but they keep auto replicating so with king having uncovered this they should be safe moving forward and believe me they don't want to get captured in zaffin space you know a, a great blue family like the blanchfords getting captured by a zaffin warlord would not be pleasant the zaffin warlord could use them for barter for leverage for prisoner exchange could take them back to whatever world they come from could torture them could put them to sport could devour them if they're cannibals which happens a lot in Zaffin space so getting captured is not a pleasant thought at all now that they figured out will hella's game they should be more safe as they approach Wham. And then you got a brief taste of Wilhella's sense of humor, her obsession with body humor, with creating all these scenarios and situations, and which none of them really were too pleased with, except for Sarah, who has a morose imagination. She found them quite entertaining, even though nobody else did. Get ready for more of that as we continue to Chapter 11, Thomasina the 19th, Let's get to it straight away, shall we? Following King's suggested regimen of sight cleansings, Wilhella's STTs were cleared out and eventually gone for good. They continued on to Wham without further incident. The harassing hollows and whammocks abruptly ceased, though Sarah rather loudly lamented missing her lurid broadcast, starring the four of them. After two more days, the hollow terminal came back to life as the planet Gothen came into view. The city of Wham was located on the northern continent and covered most of it. When the goshawk came into range, Sarah eagerly turned the hollow terminal back on. It was literally smoking hot with messages, mostly from their new friend, Will Hella Corman Grand. How is number six, Lord Cable? As exquisite as you remember, was she? I shall advise you not to turn off your terminal. I don't like being ignored. Do not ignore me. Well done on securing the worthless left bishop. I assure you the rest will not be so easily found. Did you enjoy the STTs? Did you? I'm going to make number six suffer for giving it up so easily. And the messages went on and on, along with the lurid and pornographic broadcast, which Sarah couldn't take her eyes off of. Philip contacted Thomasina. On the cone screen, she appeared, relieved upon seeing his face. Oh, Philip, I've been so worried about you. We're fine, Rose. It's been an uneventful trip, other than Wilhella leaving us constant whammocks, STTs, and other unpleasant messages to pass the time. She is on a real tear. She's written a number of articles in the local Zaffin periodicals about the four of you, and she's been lighting up the wires. She's even posted your approximate position in space several times, and offered a sizable bounty to any who bring you in to her in chains. You are her favorite topic at the moment. She does tend to fixate on things. She had us rigged with STTs and was able to zero in on us with them, but King cleared them out. We're fine for now. I don't want you to land in Wham. She announced Kay's presence in your group and his status as a Shadow Tech male. The specters from any number of orders are out in force looking for you. The streets aren't safe right now. I want you to dock on the Sparrow and I shall meet you there. Fine. We should be in docking range within the hour. Thomasina smiled. I cannot wait to see you, Philip, and everyone else as well. I love you. And I love you, Rose. 
The ship traffic greatly increased as the planet approached. Soon, a great spiral, rather greenish in appearance, appeared in the distance, floating high over the planet like a gigantic bacterium. What is that? Sam asked, watching the spiral getting nearer and nearer. That, Sam, is Dashala, otherwise known as the Sparrow. It's Rose's ship. It's a gift she inherited from her father. Sam gazed at the odd and rather ominous looking craft. Why is it shaped like that? It's a Bondaranga vessel. Her father was a man of Bondar, which is a municipality of the city. They are known for their odd structures. Sarah jumped in. It's supposed to be a building style that promotes the rapid evolution of the body. These weird shapes and stuff are supposed to do that. Really a lot of bull if you ask me. Well, the proof might be in the pudding, Philip said. Rose can fly after all. How did that happen without some sort of evolutionary process at work? She can fly? Sam asked. Yes, she can, Philip replied with a hint of pride. Perhaps crawling around in these insane Bondarunga ships does in fact promote evolution. After all, if not in the body, then at least in the mind. As the sparrow got nearer, it revealed itself to be a very strange craft. It was three miles long and half a mile in circumference. It was made up of nothing but a central spiral having no recognizable bow or stern, nor did it appear to have a dorsal or ventral section. It didn't even appear to be made of metal, but rather some sort of organic looking greenish material. Philip maneuvered the gossok through the massive spirals and headed towards the depression in the center of it all, which appeared to be a small defect on the surface of the ship. That's where we're docking up ahead, Philip said, pointing. It's really tight in there, so be ready for it. As the gossok approached, the depression bulged out of the surface of the ship like an expanding blister. Philip slowed the ship, and after a moment or two, the blister enveloped the goshawk like an amoeba engulfing a bit of prey. The amorphous material flowed around the hull, covering the front glass. The goshawk shuddered and then was still. All right, Philip said, unstrapping from his seat. We're here. He opened the hatch. Outside was a solid, undulating mass of green with a somewhat circular opening about the size of a large coin. It was like looking down the depths of a living being's throbbing colon. We're going into there? Sam asked, her voice flecked with a bit of horror. Sure are, Sarah said, throwing her duster on. Come on! She fearlessly got on her knees and stuffed herself into the hole. The material seemed to expand and mold and form around her. Her torso vanished, followed by her waist, then her legs and boots. I feel more evolved already, Sarah cried from within, her voice muffled. King, please stay here and guard the ship, all right, Philip said, before he disappeared into the hole. Resigned, King settled on the pilot's chair without argument. Sam followed, stuffing herself through the hole, and then Kay went in. Once inside... The undulating interior of the tube seemed to push them along, guiding them to an unknown place deep within the innards of the ship. Soon they emerged in a tiny area that was just large enough for them to stand erect. There, Thomasina the 19th of Wham waited for them. As Sam and Kay emerged, Thomasina had her arms thrown around Philip, a look of exultant joy on her face. She was a tall woman, leggy, fit, buxom with intense eyes full of unlit fire and a rather fierce of disposition she wore her usual green and brown leather armor in an athletic manner her hair green only a few days earlier was now back to its natural brown color except for a distinctive greenish streak running down the front welcome everyone she said welcome all welcome to the sparrow she offered her green gloved ham to sam and shook it this is like no sh other sh ship I've ever been on, Sam said. Thomasina laughed. Yes, this ship is built in the he or helix form of Bondarunga. It was my father's and now it belongs to me. I spent a fair portion of my childhood on this ship, crawling about the decks. Really, it feels just like home to me and I promise you'll be used to it in no time as well. Come, I've refreshments awaiting. They followed Thomasina into a stomach-like room filled with bizarre, strangely crafted furniture. They slithered into the oddly shaped seats and refreshments were brought in. After a bit of initial dismay, Sam appeared to adapt to the insane surroundings and enjoyed her refreshment, once again donning her drunk bung to thwart inebriation. Thomasina sat down next to Philip on an odd couch. 
It's so nice to meet you at last, Lady Samadoran. May I please call you Sam? Of course. Kay's devotion to you touched me greatly during his initial visit, and it was thanks to your quest that my Philip was brought to me here in Wham. Ald's will is truly amazing. Now, as I said earlier, well, hell has got the city in an uproar. Wham is not safe for you now, nor will it be any time soon. Is Wilhella seeking our blood? Well, that's hard to say. She has a rather remorse sense of humor, but her caprices do tend to shift as the days go by. I don't think she's trying to kill you, per se. I think she simply wants you dragged into her presence so she can gloat a bit and make a good show. Thomasina laughed. She wrote a rather entertaining bit of pornography in a recent magazine where she describes, in lurid detail, taking each and every one of you into her bed. Actually, it's very popular reading in Wham! right now. We saw the vids, Sarah said. Oh, the vids. Yes, those two. She sounds like an utter harlot, Sam said, shocked. Of course she's a harlot. She's been married twice to Zaff and Warlords, has had an uncountable string of lovers, and starred in a weekly program where she is paid to pursue a person, have sex with them, and then kill them right there on the screen. It was quite popular until it was discovered that it wasn't simply fiction. She is, without question, the most popular and infamous black hat in Wham. I didn't think popularity was something black hats seek, Sam said. Normally it isn't, but well, Hella's a bird of a different feather, isn't she? Depending on who you believe, she's between 200 and 500 years old. She is a black hat and under the black abbess's sway. However, she has a distinct personality and often claims to speak in public for the black abbess, who is never seen by anybody. She has been known to walk the streets in Wham with her deadly shadow tech entourage, often dines at the various restaurants in the city, causing a great stir. She has been known to kill any waiter, chef, or fellow diner who displeases her. Sarah consulted her terminal. Thomasina, what is this, the nether day roll she participates in? I saw it described in the hollows, but I didn't quite understand what it is. What is it? Thomasina laughed. Every nether day, as it's celebrated in the league, she attempts to mock the holiday by having sex the entire time, from sun up to sun down. Her self-proclaimed record is 2,000 men and women in one day. Sarah was impressed. Holy gods! You know, she sounds kind of cool. Are you insane, Sarah? Sam cried. She sounds like a burlesque clown. Oh, come on, Sam. Appreciate the madness. Don't tell that to any chef, waiter, or tailor she happens to cross paths with, Thomasina said. She rose to even greater acclaim when she invented Whammock some years back. She's also a bit of a coward. She's talked her way out of fights with the Sisterhood of Light and with other black hats over 20 times in the past. She appears to value her own life very greatly. She was thought to have been killed at least three times, however those are proven to be unfortunate stand-ins doing the fighting for her. So as I said, this sort of public spectacle is right up her alley and she's making the most of it. Let me show you something. Thomasina picked up a control glyph and called up a holographic panel. The Sparrow didn't used to be equipped with holographics. I added it in some years ago. I like it very much. Let's see. She called up a hollow picture of a bustling urban scene in Wham Core. In the center, straddling a broad artificial river, a massive black skyscraper over 2,000 feet tall rose up into the heights. That's Wilhilla's temple in the municipality of Krant. Her temple was placed in the heart of a great rectangular forest or jungle. The temple rose far above the treetops and into the clouds like a black tombstone. A broad path, straight as a laser beam and red as frothy blood, led into the temple mouth. Lining the path were a series of four towering statues made of black stone each at least 50 feet tall. The statues were in the likenesses of two men and two women. They were all nude and garishly posed, lit up in the occasional beams of roving black spotlights panning upward into the sky. Hey! Sarah cried in horror. Those statues she's got down there! That's us! Upon closer inspection, Sarah was proved to be correct. There was a Sarah statue reared back and naked as the day she was born. And Philip, too, nude as well. Sam's statue had hair down to her ankles. Sam looked at the scene with a dispassionate eye. I believe my breasts are quite a bit bigger than that proportionally, she said. Sarah, as usual, was transfixed. She gawked. 
It was easy to see that she liked the nude statue of herself, was flattered by it, in fact, despite Wilhilla's best efforts. She continued to gaze at the hollow and became quite puzzled. What's wrong with the K statue, she asked. It seems deformed. Kay's naked statue was massively oversized in the male area, so much so that several Shadow Tech carts were propped beneath it, holding it up. Additionally, a host of ragged slaves attended to it with brooms and rags. Sarah stared at the grotesque statue of Kay and started laughing. Holy gods, Kay, your penis is twice as long as you are tall! Sarah, Sam said, this is not funny. Yes, it is! Look at it, Sam! Sorry, Kay, you gotta admit, that's funny. I see nothing humorous about this, Kay said. We're here on an important mission for our cousin. Oh, come on! Look at that! Your penis has to be at least two city blocks long. Kay, you wish! Oh, you so wish! Kay ignored her. Sarah, please. Well, Hella is simply trying to humiliate us and throw us off our game. So, Thomasina, how do you suggest we proceed? I think the best way to avoid all the unpleasantness is to simply cable down at high speed and walk right in. You have an invitation, so that shall offer up a bit of protection at least. Cable down? Surely you remember my cable cars that I use in Ald. Coaches that are connected to the Sparrow via reinforced gel-filled cables. The Sparrow remains geosynchronous with all. As the average cable length is 400 miles from here to the surface, a small amount of movement here creates a massive amount of movement on the surface. It's swift, covert, the cars are armored and cannot be shot down unless they go for the cables, which are shielded, and best of all, as oncoming traffic does not want to hit the cables, people tend to get out of your way. We can take a car down at high speed, then I can spirit you away just as fast. The only issue is that the descent into the atmosphere will probably collapse your lungs. So you'll need filler. Filler? Kay asked. You'll see. It'll be fine. We have an invitation, but you don't. Where will you be, Thomasina? Sarah asked. I'll orbit about at rooftop level and monitor the situation, as I'm sure Will Hella will broadcast the whole thing live for all to see. When you're done, or if things go bad, I'll come down immediately. Well, what are we waiting for? They followed Thomasina into another area of the ship. It was the most open and conventional area of the Sparrow that they'd seen to that point. Overhead were a dozen giant spools of thick, tough-looking cable, mounted on gimbals. The cables went down through the floor area of the bay and moved through it effortlessly, like a fishing line through the surface of a calm lake. The floor of the bay flows around the cables, allowing them to move without resistance, while still easily supporting our weight and remaining a space-worthy seal. See? Who says Zaffins can't design innovative shipping? Thomasina was clearly very proud of her ship. Ahead was a sturdy green and brown card being serviced by several of Thomasina's Singing Ten assistants. High above, an operator in a control room signaled for Thomasina's attention. One moment, please, she said, and then stepped into the air and flew like a wingless bird to the room high overhead. She spoke a few words to the operator, then flew back down. All right. We're ready. An attendant wheeled in a rack of a number of helmets connected via tubes to small tanks. Thomasina took one off the rack and held it up. These are filler breathing devices. You put the helmet on, and the interior fills with a dense mist supplied from these tanks. You might at first have difficulty breathing the mist in and feel the need to panic. Do not fear. That is a normal reaction. Be calm. Breathe normally, and you'll soon be used to it. The mist will shore up your lungs and prevent them collapsing during the fast descent. Also, the mist will get into your blood and thicken it a bit, further protecting your bodies. Please put them on now. Philip, let me help you. They each selected a tank and a helmet and donned them. The helmet made a firm seal below their chins, and they could see displays and readouts through the tinted, slightly bubbly visors. The tanks were hung on their backs, strapped in place and engaged. Quickly, a smoky, rather unpleasant-smelling gas filled the helmet. It was dense and virtually impossible to get into the lungs without a monumental struggle. Sarah appeared to be smothering, and Philip was little better, clutching at his neck. Kay blinked and struggled to breathe. Sam was seemingly not having an issue, and tentatively put her hands on his shoulders, shaking him. Kay sucked and wheezed. This gas was like a brick wall. He couldn't breathe, and the bay around him spun. 
He pulled for air, fought for it, his lungs rejecting the odd gas, finding no use of it. Just as he thought he was ready to pass out, his system grudgingly responded and he recovered, slowly beating back the fire raging in his lungs. A comm link came on in his ear. You all right, Kay? Sarah asked. Yes, yes, Sarah, I'm fine. That was a ride, wasn't it? Kay's legs felt a bit shaky. Sure, sure. Thomasina, who wasn't wearing a helmet, finished adjusting Philip's tank. We need King, Sarah said through her helmet. I should go get him. Your bird? I'll have one of my assistants fetch him. Thomasina looked them over, checked their straps, and approved. I think we're ready. Let's get in, shall we? They got into the waiting car. It was rich and luxurious within, with a control seat located at the front on the right side and an adjacent co-pilot seat on the left. Behind them were three spacious rows of bench seats. Thomasina hopped into the control seat and a colorful array of holographic displays came to life around her. Everybody strap in. There were a number of jump seats arranged along the sides of the car. They seated themselves in the jump seats and were strapped in. The seats expanded and form-fitted to their bodies, locking them into place. Thomasina made her way back and double-checked everybody, her feet not touching the floor of the car. She took Kay's car and put it into a locker under the second second row of padded bench seats along with Sarah and Philip's saps. She double checked Philip's seat and gave his visor a kiss. Are you not wearing a tank? Kay asked. I don't need one. I'm used to this. As she finished checking them over, King fluttered in and perched on a seat. About time you showed up, Sarah said through the comm. Shall I strap this bird in? Thomasina asked, clicking in over their helmet comms. He'll be fine, Sarah said. What is this bird? Just curious. He's King. He's going to be our muscle down there, just in case Will Hella decides to get nuts on us, Sarah responded. Thomasina considered that a moment, then returned to her pilot's seat and strapped herself in. Sam, sitting next to Kay, laced her fingers in with his as they waited. Looking over, he saw the tentative tinted bubble of her helmet, with tentacles of black hair leeching out of the bottom staring at him. He squeezed her hand and she squeezed back. All the hatches and seals in the car closed tight and hissed. Sarah, sitting across from them, looked around expectantly. She fidgeted, clearly excited by what they were about to experience. Without warning, the four stout cables supporting the car went taut, and the car was lifted into the open air of the bay. Slowly, the operator in the control cabin high above swung the car out over the central part of the bay, where they dangled in space for a moment. Thomasina said a few words into the comm, then the operator lowered the car down. Instead of stopping at the floor, the car continued through the floor, which molded and flowed around them. Kay saw the gimbal and spool supporting them high overhead, paying out cable, and he saw nothing but green as they dropped through the floor. The car descended in greenish murk for a few moments, and finally emerged into space. There was Gothen spreading out in a giant green and brown ball far below, reflecting rich, clear sunlight. The brownish, wheel-like layout and light-laced living circulation of Wham waited for them below. Wham's orderly urban plan was clear, even from space. Thomasina expertly adjusted the car's position, gas vented out in response to her control movements. She looked back at Philip one last time. Ready? Philip raised his hand in affirmative. The car hung there for a quiet moment. A quad set of rockets came blasting to life and the car plummeted into the atmosphere at a shocking rate of speed. Kay felt the world drop out beneath him. He blacked out for a moment, reawakening just in time to see a curtain of fire and smoke licking up from the base of the car past the windows and upward in a comet-like tail as the car punched its way into Gothen's atmosphere. Sam's black hair squirting out the bottom of her helmet was everywhere, floating and whipping about within the cabin like a sea monster's tentacles. Sarah's blue ponytail did the same, only on a much smaller scale. Just when Kay didn't think they could go any faster, Thomasina did something with the control panel and the rockets came on again, introducing a second sickening wave of wrenching speed. Through all of this, King sat where he was perched like nothing was happening. The speed was too much. Kay felt himself blacking out a second time. Warnings and alerts came on in his visor. When he came to, a concerned Sam was leaning over him, a curtain of her black hair draping over his face. She had removed her helmet and his as well, patting him on the cheeks. Kay? 
Kay, darling? Sarah leaned over him as well, smiling, and there was King also with his dispassionate silver face. Thought you were dead for a second there, Kay, Sarah said. Wasn't that cool? That was awesome. I want to do it again. Sam unstrapped Kay and helped him up. The environs within the car were quite a bit different now. The roof of the car was gone, tucked up and folded away, admitting the starry night. Through blurry eyes, Kay saw the four cables supporting the car shooting vertically upward into the sky until they seemed to vanish. He saw stars laid out in unfamiliar constellations and drifts of clouds lit up in pinkish light from below. How long have I been out? A few minutes, Sam said. How are you feeling? I think we're almost down. Fine. I'm fine. Did you black out too? No, darling, I, I didn't. What can I do for you? Nothing. I'm fine. Thank you. Thomasina flew the car, Philip sitting next to her. Her control movement sent signals up the cable to the sparrow high overhead. Those signals were translated into real movement down below. Sitting in the car, it didn't feel like flying. Rather, it felt like being in a fast elevator. It was silent and vibration-free. Kay got out of his jump seat and fetched his car from where Thomasina had placed it. He saddled it and peered over the side. Below, the impressive rooftops and city streets of Wham went off in all directions. The buildings came in swarms, some rectangular and flat-topped, others scalloped and gothic in form, mixed in with low-lying industrial and residential areas. Other pockets of buildings were made in organic spirals, like the Sparrow. Scattered here and there were buildings shaped like giant statues in various poses and states of dress. There was a mass of flying traffic below, mostly concentrated in the eight main arteries that led in from the distant outlying regions of Wham to the core at the center. A persistent dusting of traffic zipped about like a cloud of electrons over a huge nucleus. As Thomasina had said, the outlying traffic seemed to avoid her cable car and gave it plenty of space. Ahead was an ominous black rectangle towering above its neighboring buildings, dark and windowless and wreathed in a crown of black spotlights and purple mist. That's Wilhilla's temple, Thomasina pointed out. They leaned over the side to have a look at it. As in Thomasina's hollow, it was situated in the center of a rectangular terrace grove near an artificial river. Unlike other black hack temples in Wham and elsewhere which were shunned in lonely places, her temple was lit up and landscaped, forcing its way into the heart of the city, whether the city wanted it there or not. It was also plunked right in the middle of a main traffic artery, forcing the masses of traffic to veer around it or plow square into the temple. A number of purplish searchlights reaching up into the night sky panned about at the base of the temple. Near the 2,000-foot upper reaches of the structure, a churning gothic cloud of winged shadow tech beasts orbited in a steady, clockwise fashion. The top of the Universe restaurant glowed in ebon purple lights. There's a restaurant, Sarah pointed out. Anybody hungry? As the temple neared, they spotted the collection of garish statues of themselves arrayed on the red carpet in front of the structure. There's you and your gigantic dick down there, Kay. Do you see that? Sarah said, pointing. Seeing his likeness firsthand with its monstrously huge penis made Kay laugh, despite himself. We'll be down in a minute or two, Tom and Cena said. I shall climb away and loiter once you've disembarked. I'll be monitoring the proceedings from above. When you're finished, I'll come down and collect you, then we'll be back aboard the Sparrow in short order. Allow me to offer you this advice and a warning. Do not venture into the grove surrounding the temple. It's tricked out with old shadow tech and whamites she's turned into monsters. Well, Hela often likes to say she captures people's nightmares and forms them into shadow tech, which she allows to roam her grove. None venturing into it ever come out the same, if they come out at all. Good to know, Sarah said. Thomasina brought the cable car down near the yawning entrance to the temple at the end of the Grand Avenue, leading into it lined with red carpet. Philip gave her a warm kiss and threw on his sap. When they were all clear, the car silently lifted away and disappeared from sight. Kay unsaddled his car. I see no reason to delay. Let's get this over with. Sarah and Philip checked their dusters and pulled their Potava pistols. They cocked and readied them, returning the weapons to their coats. Sam, are you armed? Sarah asked. Sam shook her head. Her speed, strength, and deadly claws were weapons enough. King fluttered overhead. 
Alert. The grove around us is heavy with shadow tech. If anybody or anything gets cute, King, you know what to do, Sarah said. You've got the green light for mayhem and max damage, boyo. He didn't respond. Ready, Sam? Kay asked. She nodded and they walked down the path. As they neared the huge open doorway, a loud wave of clapping came from the leafy reaches of the grove to either side, cheering them on. They heard whistles and huzzahs. Chiding voices spoken by hard mouths assailed their ears. Come here. Hey, come here. We've got something for you. We've gifts. We've candy. We've puppies. Come here. Let us show you. As they passed under the propped up ridiculous largeness of Kay's statue's penis, the clapping and whistling from the grove rose to a shouting cheer. What is making those noises, Sarah asked. Kay glanced into the tangled green of the grove. You don't want to know. They emerged on the other side. A great torrent of water was rushing out of the head of Kay's penis and shooting into the river in a fast spray. I hadn't noticed that before, Sarah laughed and pointed. Look at that! They're having a big pee! Ha 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 ha! They continued on through the open door. Unchallenged, they entered the temple of Wilhella Corman Grand, the mad black hat of Wham. And with that, we conclude chapter 11, Thomasina the 19th. So, finally, they arrive in Wham, find out Will Hella Corman Grand's got the city in a tizzy, and it's not safe for their party, especially for Kay being a Shadow Tech male. Fortunately, Thomasina the 19th had her ship in orbit, the Sparrow, and with it, they used her cable car system to jet down fast, as fast as possible, and go direct into her temple. Her ship, B Bondaranga, is like a whole branch of science that is described in other books. And it was invented there on Wham, where the Whamites are invested in evolution. And supposedly, these weird structures are supposed to stress the body and help it evolve. There's different types of Bondaranga. Some is more whacked out than others. The he style is usually means that it's like in a helix. Like a, like a spiral, basically. And that's what her ship is like. And it's supposed to promote evolution. As Thomasina can fly, that seems to be doing something. It sounded good at the time. Our intrepid band has finally entered the horrid reaches of Wilhella's temple. And we will see what happens next week when we proceed to chapter 12. Known as Roasts and Boasts, where our intrepid heroes come face to face with the mad black hat of Wham, Will Hella Cormant Grant. That is next week. Until then, this is Ren Presents. I'm your host, Ren. Peace out.